All right, so I told you at the orientation to this course that if you don't learn the brachial plexus, it'll come back to bite you in exam after exam. So um, just a quick run through. So remember our C5 and C6 nerve roots come together and form the superior trunk. C7 just continues on here as the middle trunk. C8 and T1 as the uh, inferior trunk. All right, and so we have a couple of important nerves here at the root level. So the dorsal scapular nerve supplies the rhomboids. Long thoracic nerve supplies serratus anterior. And that would be a common question. A lesion here, of course, would give you a scapular winging. Um, now, there's only one nerve here off of the trunk level, and that is the suprascapular nerve uh, that comes off of the superior trunk. So that supplies infraspinatus and supraspinatus. Um, this part of the plexus is, is pretty easy because the inferior trunk, well, all three trunks can contri contribute a division to the posterior cord, right? But the inferior trunk um, just continues down as the medial cord, okay, and then to the ulnar nerve and also gives off a branch to the median nerve, okay? So that's why an ulnar neuropathy looks so much like a C8-T1 radiculopathy because just as a sh straight shot right down there. All right, so again, all three trunks contribute a division to the posterior cord, um, which gives off the radial nerve, which supplies a whole bunch of muscles, mainly extensor muscles in the arm, wrist, and fingers, and then also the axillary nerve, which supplies the deltoids muscle. Okay, <coughs> the lateral cord um, gives a branch to the median nerve, but also the musculocutaneous nerve, which supplies the biceps, comes off the lateral cord. Whoops. And then we have two important sensory branches here. One is the medial anabrachial cutaneous, and that supplies the medial forearm. So remember when we were talking about ulnar neuropathy, and I told you if the numbness comes up the medial forearm, then that's not an ulnar neuropathy because the medial forearm uh, isn't supplied by the ulnar nerve. It's supplied by the medial anabrachial cutaneous. Okay, the lateral anabrachial cutaneous usually comes off here, the musculocutaneous, kind of right at this junction, and so that supplies the lateral forearm with sensation. And, of course, there are some other details we could put in, but, but if you know this much, I think for neuro, um, I'll be happy. So the clavicle, remember if the arms are at the side, the clavicle overlies the division. It's a really important landmark because gunshot wound, trauma, patient comes in with arm weakness, um, is the stab wound above or below the clavicle? If it's below the clavicle, it's not a trunk or a root lesion. It has to be a cord lesion or maybe even a very proximal lesion of the median ulnar or radial nerves. Okay, so the median nerve is kind of a good testing point here because it's so complex. You so we just said the median nerve is sensation, is thumb, index, long finger, half of the ring finger. And so by dermatomes, uh, well, just remember, the dermatomes are C5 coming down the lateral arm, C6 to the thumb, C7 is the palm, digits 2, 3, and 4, C8 is the fifth digit, and T1 is up the medial forearm. Okay, so we know that the, the median nerve sensation then is a C6 and a C7 root distribution. And so the C6 and C7 are here, so sensation for the median nerve comes back like this through the lateral cord, superior trunk, and some along here, the medial, uh, middle trunk. Whereas, think of all the median muscles in the hand. Those are all C8 and T1. So the motor fibers for the median nerve come this way, from C8, T1, inferior trunk, medial cord, and then down to the median nerve. Okay, so you're kind of thinking you have to do, thinking about the brachial plexus. And then this is probably the most confusing there, the median nerve. Okay, so here's the root distribution. Um, and again, oftentimes with a radiculopathy or plexopathy, just the numbness will tell you uh, where the lesion is. So remember, C5 is lateral arm. C6 is down to the thumb. Um, don't be stressed out if you see review books and they show C6 as being the index finger. Sometimes it is. That's kind of an overlap between C6 and C7. Uh, I think the index is more consistently C7. But anyway, palm 2, 3, and 4 is C7. C8 is the fifth digit. T1, uh, medial anabrachial cutaneous, um, is medial forearm. And then T2 is up to the chest area. Okay, so in a radiculopathy, um, you want to think of, okay, what is the sensory distribution? And also what reflexes are absent? 
So in the upper extremity, biceps and brachioradialis are C5, C6 by root. So if those are knocked out and the sensory distribution is lateral arm and thumb, then that's, those are the nerve roots involved. Um, triceps is C6 and C7, and I put C8 in parentheses because um, it's listed in a lot of review books, but from some pretty good EMG studies, it looks like triceps is just C6 and C7. So C7 is the most common radiculopathy in the upper extremity, and so that's really important that you associate, that's a good reflex you can check to assess the C7 radiculopathy. In the leg, roughly, the proximal thigh is L2, around the knee is L3, the medial calf is L4, okay, the lateral shin and top of the foot is L5, back of the leg, dorsum of the foot is S1. Okay, so in terms of reflexes, we can check patellar for L234 and Achilles for S12. Okay, so it's a very big picture then, C7 radiculopathy. It's always neck pain and shooting pain down the arm, right? But in a C7, it's going to be a numb hand, and you're going to have triceps weakness and a loss of a triceps reflex. If it's C6, it's going to be neck pain, shooting pain down to the thumb, okay, and you'll lose the biceps and brachioradialis. If it's C8T1, remember, it looks like an ulnar nerve problem. So now it's numbness in the fourth and fifth digits, uh, maybe up the medial forearm, and a lot of hand weakness. Okay, so here's the table, um, which I don't think I'm going to go over here because you'll fall asleep here. But the just to remember that C5-6 superior trunk is a very big picture. Almost all of these are proximal muscles. Okay. Um, and so deltoids, infraspinatus, supraspinatus, biceps, these are all muscles above the elbow. Uh, brachioradialis is on the one exception here is a C5-6 below the elbow. So a lot of proximal weakness for the C5-6 radiculopathy. And again, the numbness is lateral arm down to the thumb. You lose biceps and brachioradialis. C7, you need to know because it's the most common radiculopathy. So it's a numb hand, the digits two, three, and four. Triceps reflex is out. Triceps muscle is weak. Okay, and two other good muscles that have C7 are pronator teres and the finger extensors. Okay, so those are three good C7 muscles. And I will just say for C8, T1, these are all hand muscles. So all of your median and ulnar hand muscles are weak in a C8, T1 radiculopathy. So your numbness is fifth digit because that's C8 and medial forearm because that's T1. Okay, we don't have a good C8, T1 reflex, so... Even though this is a lower motor neuron problem, uh, C8, T1 radiculopathy, you're, you're still going to have your preserved triceps, biceps, and brachioradialis reflexes. Okay, so this in red is just showing you if you have a lesion of C5, C6, superior trunk, the muscles that will be weak. So again, these are all proximal, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, biceps, um, the deltoids is C5-6, but it gets to the axillary nerve like this. Brachioradialis is that one muscle here below the elbow that's C5, C6. The C7 radiculopathy, I'm going to show you another picture of that. But C8, T1, again, the hand. So all of the median and ulnar muscles are going to be weak with either a C8, T1 or an inferior trunk lesion. All right, so this is another picture of a good sensor distribution. And notice uh, this person didn't agree with me about the index finger. That's not a big deal. So sometimes the index finger can be C6. Okay. And then here would be some of the, uh, the sensory distribution by trunks and cords. But I don't want to bog down too much here. So C7 radiculopathy, I show a picture just because that's the most common. So we've um, just been over that quite a bit. It's mainly hand numbness is the second most common cause of a numb hand next to carpal tunnel. Okay, and so again, triceps, pronator teres, the finger extensors, three good C7 muscles. Okay, a superior trunk lesion um, or a, a real bad C5-6 radiculopathy. Um, again, think of what's the sensory, motor, and reflex changes. Sensory distribution from a C5, C6 superior trunk lesion would be lateral arm down to the thumb. Okay. What are C5, C6 reflexes? Again, biceps and brachioradialis. Okay. 
And remember that the lesion here is where you get the waiter's tip position because normally these muscles like supraspinatus and infraspinatus, they externally rotate and abduct the arm. So now the arm gets pulled to the side and it gets internally rotated. So this is the waiter's tip position and classically that is uh, an obstetrical palsy, herbs palsy, where the infant after a difficult delivery has the arm in this position. And if you see that, uh, you know where the lesion is. Okay, inferior trunk lesions. Um, so we had a case study and talked about open heart surgery where about 5% of these patients from excessive retraction of the rib cage will stretch and damage the inferior trunk of their brachial plexus. And so again, C8, T1 inferior trunk, think of the hand. Okay, so it's gonna be lots and lots of hand weakness. Um, and the C8, T1 sensory distribution. So fifth digit, medial forearm. Okay, and reflexes are probably going to be normal in that patient. All right, if we get down to the lower extremity, L2, 3, 4 nerve roots, uh, a ridic radiculopathy there looks just like a lumbar plexopathy. Well, the, the, um, these nerve roots, L2, 3, 4, become the lumbar plexus. Okay, so three good muscles here would be iliacus, so that's hip flexion, quadriceps, leg extension, and bringing the knees together, adduction. Okay, I told you the sensory distribution for L234, which is anterior thigh, knee, and down to the medial calf. And of course, if we have a lesion here, we're gonna lose the patellar reflex. Okay, L5 radiculopathy, boy, there are a lot of muscles here. Remember, the big picture is it's gonna be a patient with back pain, shooting pain down the leg, and a foot drop. Okay, and the, so the perineal muscles are weak, like tibialis anterior, perineus longus, that's eversion. And so I just told you that foot inversion is usually our most helpful thing here, turning the foot in, because that's tibial nerve. Okay, but the L5 roots do supply also hamstrings and gluteus medius. Okay, and gluteus medius is for um, abduction, hip abduction. So your sensory loss in L5 is gonna be lateral leg, top of the foot, and we don't have a reliable L5 reflex. So reflexes are normal, okay? P so for boards, the most common radiculopathy you will be asked again and again is an S1 radiculopathy. So again, don't choose sciatic nerve, choose S1 nerve root. Sciatic neuropathies are really rare. So, so it's pain down the back of the leg. So the sensory loss is posterior leg, the bottom of the foot, you lose the Achilles reflex. Okay, and so here are some good S1 muscles. Gastrocnemius, plantar flexion. Gluteus maximus, and also hamstrings for knee uh, flexion. Okay, so again, these maps vary, but L2 is around the thigh, L, uh, L3 is the knee, L4 is medial calf, L5 is lateral shin, top of the foot, S1 is back of the leg, bottom of the foot. Okay, I'm not gonna go over this except to just point out a couple of things. Um, so notice here that we have our roots and plexus and ah, that the superior and inferior gluteal nerve, which supply gluteus medius and maximus respectively, that if, if these muscles are involved, um, that's, that's helpful. That's usually what we're gonna see with an L5 or a S1 radiculopathy, a really proximal lesion. So I'm gonna show you what uh, gluteus medius uh, weakness looks like here in just a minute. Okay, well, hopefully we don't have another one of these issues here where the slides advance on their own. Um, uh, the other thing I just wanted to point out here is with the lumbar plexus, okay, so we've got the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve here, um, that if you have a L234 radiculopathy or plexopathy, um, you're gonna have weakness of both femoral and obturator distribution. So it's gonna be leg extension will be weak, but also the obturator is the adductor muscles. So you also have adduction uh, weakness. Okay, so we went over that. And a few specific things so common is lateral femoral cutaneous neuropathy. So remember it's tight pants, usually an overweight individual. And the only thing they have on exam is numbness in the lateral thigh. Okay, otherwise everything is normal. No weakness, no reflex changes. Okay, if we had an obturator neuropathy, 
you would have numbness in the medial thigh area and you'd only have weakness with thigh adduction. Okay, a retroperitoneal hematoma, uh, one of the cases we did here in the case study, so patients are on a blood thinner like heparin and usually they have back pain and so a lot of weakness involving all the L234 muscles, which remember all, are all proximal muscles, quadriceps, hip flexion. Um, so they're gonna have weakness in both the femoral and obturator distribution, and they're gonna have a lot of thigh, knee, and medial calf numbness. All right, remember gluteus medius weakness, you get that hip drop that um, we've mentioned a few times um, when you step on the opposite foot. Okay, so let's move on now to anterior horn cell um, conditions. So ALS, remember that think of ALS as a motor neuron disease. So they should not have sensory loss or any sensory findings. So it's a double hit on motor neurons. It's the upper motor neurons in the motor cortex of the brain. Okay, so you get Wallerian degeneration of pathways like the cortical bulbar tract, the cortical spinal tract, Okay, but you also lose the lower motor neurons. Okay, so like the hypoglossal nucleus, that's a lower motor neuron to the tongue. Um, or the, all of the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord, the anterior horn cells. Okay, so weakness is rapidly progressive because you're losing both upper and lower motor neurons. Um, okay, so don't forget about the um, cortical bulbar tract. Okay, because that is going down, in the case of ALS, it's predominantly the cortical bulbar tract going down to the medulla that's affected. So to supply the hypoglossal nucleus, the nucleus ambiguous for talking and swallowing, um, these are knocked out frequently early. So early symptom of ALS is dysarthria, dysphagia. And so this is part of the, if it's up here, cortical bulbar tract degeneration, uh, that's pseudobulbar palsy. Remember these patients have easy laughing and crying Okay, but if, if early on the more of the degeneration is of the hypoglossal nucleus and of the nucleus ambiguous, now you're gonna see a lot of tongue atrophy. Um, and so the patient's also gonna have dysarthria and dysphagia, but bulbar palsy doesn't give you the um, emotional incontinence, all of the crying, easy crying, easy laughing. And oftentimes we'll see the two together, pseudobulbar palsy and bulbar palsy. And so again, that's why talking and swallowing is such a prominent feature of ALS. Okay, so the lesion is up here, and then you get Wallerian degeneration of the cortical spinal tract all the way down. Okay, so that's purple, and um, we drew this kind of here from the mouth down to remind you that the problems in ALS um, are really uh, bulbar and down. So the eyes are relatively preserved. So there's weakness from the mouth down and then the anterior horn cells and lower motor neurons in the medulla are affected. And so you get atrophy from the mouth all the way down. Okay, and I didn't mention, but remember with any anterior horn cell disease, fasciculations are so prominent. So what's preserved in ALS? Um, uh, basically the pathways uh, or motor neurons above the medulla are preserved. So eye movements tend to be normal. Sensory nerves are relatively normal and bowel and bladder function is also uh, normal in ALS. Okay, so here's a picture showing you the Wallerian degeneration here of the cortical spinal tract. So one medication that uh, you need to know about for ALS, um, not dramatically effective, but really is all. And so the mechanism here is against the NMDA receptors. Again, the idea here is that um, dysfunction of these NMDA receptors can lead to calcium excessive calcium influx and cell death. So blocking that seems to help just a little bit. Okay, polio is an anterior horn cell disease, but dramatically different, of course. Now we're not affecting upper motor neurons, but just typically anterior horn cells in the spinal cord. So depending on where it is, if it's just mainly lumbosacral anterior horn cells, the patient has leg weakness. Um, if the anterior horn cell destruction is up in the cervical cord, they may have some arm weakness. Okay, but like ALS, this isn't gonna involve sensory nerves at all. Okay, you're just gonna have a patient with focal weakness, atrophy, loss of reflexes. Okay, so there's the lesion in polio. And again, this could vary depending on the destruction, but if it's mainly lumbosacral, 
um, it'll be leg glucose. Okay, so remember West Nile virus is the current uh, kind of equivalent of polio. So these patients have an encephalitis and a meningitis and a certain percentage will have a knockout of anterior horn cells. And these patients, sometimes the basal ganglia can be involved in the encephalitis, so patients may have um, a movement disorder along with it. So here's kind of a summary um, of what we've gone over so far. And um, maybe I'm just going to let you look at this on your own. Next, hopefully you read through this one more time before the exam, but it's kind of a, a summary of everything we've done so far. Okay, so let's move up here to spinal cord. Okay, so you want to remember the columnar arrangement of these three pathways that we've talked about so much. So this is just arbitrarily a section at T1. And so at T1, notice that with the cortical spinal tract, the sacral fibers are lateral and then lumbar and then thoracic. And if we were to show you a cervical cord section, the cervical descending fibers would be most medial. Okay, same arrangement for the spinal thalamic tract. Sacral fibers are lateral, lumbar, thoracic, um, cervical. So with the posterior columns, um, it's the opposite. Okay, so now the sacral fibers are medial, and this is completely arbitrary here, but at T6, we separate and call it fasciculus grossalis below T6 and fasciculus cuneatus above T6. It's the same pathway. Okay, but essentially then you want to associate um, vibration and proprioception in the leg in terms of a named pathway with the fasciculus grossalis and for the arm, the fasciculus cuneatus. Okay, so out laterally here, we have two uh, important cerebellar pathways we'll talk about later. Um, remember Clark's nucleus, which is um, an important relay nucleus for the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. That was from last year. Um, here are anterior horn cells. Okay, and so um, remember that the small fibers <coughs> for pain, temperature, relatively unmyelinated, these are the ones that cross here at the, the ventral white commissure, whoops, and join with the spinal thalamic tract, whereas the large myelinated fibers, these ascend um, here in the posterior columns. <coughs> All right, so corticospinal tract, you should have this down by now here. Of course, um, crosses here at the junction of the medulla and the spinal cord is the pyramidal vexation and travels down the opposite spinal cord, innervates anterior horn cells via a little interneuron. And just some important details, really important you know that this pathway goes through the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So that's why that putaminal hemorrhage, which sits right on the posterior limb of the internal capsule, uh, that's why you get the hemiplegia with a bleed in that area. Okay, travels through the cerebral peduncles, through the pons, and then the medulla is not shown, but here where the fibers cross and travel down is the cortical spinal tract in the opposite half of the cord. Okay, spinal thalamic tract. So the critically important thing here is to remember that these pain and temperature fibers as they enter, they may ascend for a segment or two, that's Lissauer's tract, but the more important thing here is that the synapse and the crossing occurs really soon. So pain and temperature crosses to the opposite side once those fibers come into the spinal cord. Okay, and so important here is that um, these pain and temperature fibers travel through the lateral medulla. So they're going to be involved in lateral medullary syndrome and that's why you get contralateral loss of pain and temperature in lateral medullary syndrome. Okay, DPL of the thalamus is the thalamic nucleus and I've lived with this typo for about five years now, the post-central gyrus, but <laughs> anyway, didn't notice it until it was too late. Okay, now the dorsal columns. So for vibration and proprioception, again, these do not cross in contrast to pain and temperature. So it travels up the fasciculus grossalis and cuneatus. Synapse in the very low part of the medulla as the nucleus, grossalis and cuneatus. Okay, the crossing fibers for vibration and proprioception are called internal arcuate fibers, and then they become the medial lemniscus. So when you think of the medial lemniscus, just equate that with the posterior columns. Okay, it's, it's crossed, but it's a continuation of the same pathways, vibration, proprioception after it's crossed. Same 
nucleus of the thalamus, VPL, and then up again to the postcentral gyrus. Okay, so most common spinal cord condition we see is compression, usually from a disc. Um, so cervical myelopathy is they're usually in the cervical area, and so you affect all of the descending uh, upper motor neuron pathways, especially the corticospinal tract, and so you get upper motor neur neuron findings below the level of the lesion. So if it's C5 compression, everything below that, like the triceps reflex, will be very brisk because that's C7. The leg reflex will be brisk. Okay. At the level of the lesion, though, you affect nerve roots. So again, if you've got a C5 disc herniation, now we're going to get a C5 or maybe a C6 radiculopathy with the numbness down the lateral arm, maybe a loss of a biceps and brachioradialis reflexes. Okay, so focal lower motor neuron findings, but as far as the spinal cord is involved, everything below the level is upper motor neuron. Uh, remember, anytime you irritate the posterior columns, you get Lermite sign. And so the patient has a sensation of a jolt of electricity traveling down their spine. Okay, anytime you compress the spinal cord, you get bowel and bladder dysfunction. And remember the difference here between the uh, acute phase, uh, that's the one where you tend to get the where the, there's no tone to the bladder and you get these huge post-void residuals where you put the catheter in and you know it's just very large. Later on, uh, then the bladder goes into the spastic phase and that's where we get urge incontinence, but the bladder can't fill to a great size then in the more chronic uh, spastic phase. Okay, and I mention this only for the sake of boards, not for anything that is practical, but when you have a cervical cord compression, um, if you theoretically scratch the abdomen, um, you, you do get some contraction. If you're a real thin individual, you can appreciate that. Um, but that contraction of the abdominal muscles, it doesn't just go to the spinal cord and back, like you think of V10 reflexes. It goes all the way up to the brain and back down to the abdomen. So if you have a cord compression, you're gonna get upper motor neuron findings below the level of the lesion but you'll lose your superficial abdominal reflexes because they have to go through the spinal cord and up to the brain and then back down through the spinal cord and, and down. So you lose superficial abdominal reflexes uh, with uh, cord compression. Okay, so here's a disc. And so when that compresses the cord, we tend to get swelling throughout the entire spinal cord. So below the level of the lesion, you're going to get upper motor neuron weakness. You're going to get loss of pain and temperature. You're going to get loss of vibration and proprioception. And it just depends on, you know, is this swelling throughout the whole cord or is it more half the cord? Okay, but the one, uh, again, top five board question on any neuro exam you'll ever take is the brown saccard syndrome, okay, where you have one half of the cord that is more affected than the other. So um, for sure, know this very well. So if we have, let's say, a hemisection of the left cord, okay, here in orange is our cortical spinal tract, right? So the, there are going to be upper motor neuron findings below the level of the lesion on the same side. So it's ipsilateral. Okay, here are posterior columns. Okay, so if we have a left cord hemisection, you're going to lose vibration and proprioception, ipsilateral. Okay, and so the, the key thing, what makes brown saccard interesting is that the pain and temperature crosses over. So if we have our lesion here, the opposite side of the body has a loss of pain and temperature. Okay, so one leg is weak and the other leg, oftentimes the patient will have more, complain of more numbness and tingling here on this opposite side. Okay, remember that with the lesion above T6, um, we get this uh, condition called autonomic dysreflexia, where usually pain, like, changing a catheter or something like that, um, you just get autonomic, especially sympathetic dysfunction. So the blood pressure skyrockets, the patient begins to sweat, heart chest is pounding, very uncomfortable, and uh, can actually be life-threatening in some cases if, if the blood pressure goes to extreme levels. Okay, so if you get that story, you know uh, that's consistent with a cord compression um, higher up. Okay, some unique things here. First, if we have a tumor uh, that involves the spinal cord, uh, these will often grow out in this, um, like this, 
And so knowing the columnar arrangement then of the spinothalamic tract can be helpful. So if we have a tumor extending out like this, then what can happen, at least theoretically, is that you lose pain and temperature in the cervical, thoracic, lumbar dermatomes, but it spares the sacral dermatome. So if you've got a loss of sensation everywhere, but preserved sacral, then you know you've got something going on here in the center of the spinal cord. Okay, the more common thing that we see is syringomyelia, which is highly associated with Arnold Chiari malformation, where you've got low lying cerebellar tonsils. And here you can see how low they are here. And so that, that tends to cause a progressive uh, cavity to form in the center of the cord. Okay, and these always extend forward like this. And so the first pathway that's always affected is the crossing pain and temperature, the ventral white commissure. And so here the lesion, if it started out at C5, um, you would have a patient then with loss of pain and temperature in the C5 dermatome. And I wish I had had the student draw it on the other side because that's really important that you, you think of these as they're always perfectly symmetrical, bilateral, right? Because you're damaging pathways that are crossing here from both arms. Okay, so as the syrinx grows, if it extends down to C7, now you're going to have a perfectly symmetrical uh, loss of sensation in the C5, C6, and C7 dermatomes. Okay, so a loss of pain and temperature, symmetrical in both arms, is a, a syrinx. Okay, and I told you boards seem to be in a rut with asking the same question. Patient burning their hands, cooking. That's usually going to be syringomyelia. Okay, anterior spinal artery uh, infarction. So this is a stroke. So not surprisingly, these patients have stroke risk factors, diabetes, hypertension. And so it's usually the mid-upper thoracic cord. Mem remember that artery of Adam Kavitz? There's a little bit of a watershed area here. And so um, these patients will have upper motor neuron weakness and loss of pain and temperature below the level of the lesion. Okay, and the key thing here is the posterior columns are preserved. So the patient can't move their legs, they can't feel pain and temperature in their legs, but vibration proprioception is stellar, normal. If we have a posterior spinal artery stroke, um, now the patient is not weak, but they just don't know where their legs are in space, right? So their walking is very unsteady, usually a stomping gait because they're trying to get some information to the brain about where their feet are. Okay, now this is a stroke, right? So this would come on acutely. B12 deficiency, of course, is going to come on slowly over time. But these patients also have a severe loss of vibration and proprioception. And usually the demyelination also extends out here a little bit to involve the cortical spinal tract. So you have some upper motor neuron findings with B12 deficiency. Okay, and remember B12 is one of the things listed there for small fiber peripheral neuropathy. So that's why it's really, you can't localize B12 deficiency. They've got stocking glove, numbness and tingling. They've got severe loss of vibration proprioception. They've got some upper motor neuron findings. So you just need to know that constellation and associate it with B12. I would say anytime you've got a patient with slowly progressive severe loss of vibration proprioception, you know, just put that one up there at the top. Okay, if you image the spinal cord, you can actually see the demyelination here of the posterior columns. Okay, tabes dorsalis, the uh, tertiary neurocephalus here also will give you a lot of loss of vibration proprioception, but this is also a radiculopathy. You involve the sensory nerve roots, and so there's often a lot of shooting pain, um, and uh, now we're seeing this mainly in an HIV population. I didn't mention this with in our neurologic complications of HIV, but, but this is another one that we can see. Let's see, how long have we been going here? Should we take a break or do you want to keep going a bit longer? Let's do another 10, 15 minutes and then we'll take another break. Um, okay, so let's talk about muscle spindles and stretch reflexes. So remember you've got extra fusal muscle fibers that makes up the bulk of your muscle for movement. And then you have intrafusal fibers that also have contractile elements. Okay, but this is the muscle spindle. Okay, so in the muscle spindle, you have nuclear bag fibers. These are the ones that are activated by rapid stretch. 
So when you tap a tendon, like a, a deep tendon reflex, you are exciting here, you're stretching the nuclear bag fibers. Okay, and so um, that, that is primarily activated by rapid stretch. Compared to the nuclear chain fibers, which are not so much the brief rapid um, stretch. And so here we are, um, let's see, tapping uh, the patella reflex. So we're stretching the muscle spindle. Okay, again, mainly the nuclear bag fibers. And so the reflex is monosynaptic. So it just goes right back here to the anterior horn cells that supply the quadriceps in this case and the knee jerks out. But there's also a polysynaptic connection here. Notice uh, that when the signal comes in that uh, we're also inhibiting the antagonist muscle. So in this case, there's going to be inhibition going to the hamstrings. So not only does the quadriceps contract, but the hamstrings are inhibited, um, facilitating you know, your leg to shake out. And that's what's known as reciprocal um, inhibition. Okay, so you stimulate, in this case, the quadriceps and inhibit the hamstrings. All right, so um, important that you know about the gamma motor neurons. Um, so here's just the regular old alpha um, anterior horn cell, right, that we talked about degenerating in ALS. So this goes out to extrafusal fibers. <coughs> Okay, the gamma motor neuron talks to the muscle spindle. Okay, and its purpose is to keep the muscle spindle tight relative to whatever the bulk of your muscle is doing at the time, whether it's stretched or whether it's contracted. Okay, so in red here, we have the gamma motor neurons supplying the muscle spindle with the goal of keeping it um, tight. All right, so um, here we have the extrafusal muscle fibers and here is the muscle spindle, okay? And so when the muscle contracts, this is kind of artificial here. This kind of shows you what would happen if we didn't have uh, a gamma motor neuron because now the muscle spindle collapses. And so the muscle in a contracted state wouldn't be able to respond to stretch very well, okay? So when you contract the muscle, um, what happens then is the gamma motor neurons become active, here, here's the activity here, to tighten the muscle spindle. Okay, so that now in a contracted state, not notice we not only have contraction of the uh, extrafusal fibers, the bulk of your muscle, but also now the muscle spindle is tight. So the gamma motor neurons always keeping that spindle tight so it can always be responsive uh, depending on the state of flexion or um, extension. Okay, so uh, Golgi tendon organs, um, in contrast, um, are much more responsive to the state of contraction uh, or tension in the muscle. So these are right here at the junction between muscles and tendons. And so uh, here if we have the biceps muscle, so uh, supplied by an anterior horn cell. And what the Golgi tendon organs do then, when your biceps contracts, uh, it actually sends a signal back which inhibits the anterior horn cells that are trying to contract your biceps. And it actually stimulates, that should be a plus here, I know it's hard to read, but it actually stimulates the antagonist muscle, which in this case would be the triceps, okay? But this is not working against you, right? What, what this is important for is for any activity, any fine task, you're doing something with your hands where you want to contract, uh, you know, agonist and antagonist muscles at the same time. You're doing surgery or something. So the Golgi tendon organs uh, are involved in that. What really isn't appreciated here is all of this is just like the keyboard for the upper motor neurons to facilitate control of movement. Okay, so it is sometimes advantageous then to simultaneous or to um, inhibit agonists and um, activate antagonist muscles. All right, our crossed extensor reflex, which is really a circuit that we use for walking. Um, but here, if we just imagine stepping on something painful here, and of course you want to withdraw your foot, right? And so this goes into the spinal cord to um, activate um, then your flexor muscles, in this case the hamstrings, and then to inhibit the quadriceps. So your leg withdraws, okay? And so while that happens in the ipsilateral leg, in the opposite leg, 
it does exactly the opposite. Okay, so now it would um, excite the um, extensor muscles and relax the flexor muscles. And so this is, this is a circuit that is really just used for walking. You balance from one foot to the other, and so this information is kind of crossing over here uh, from one leg to the other uh, via the spinal cord. But that's known as the flexed flexion crossed extensor reflex. Okay, let's just take a little break here and then we'll, uh, we're almost up to the brainstem, I think. Yes, we are. So we'll start with the medulla from here. <laughs> 